Our next speaker today is Jim Walker. He is the VP of Product Marketing at Cockroach Labs. He is also a recovering developer, turned into a product marketer, and has spent his career in emerging tech. He believes that product marketing is one of the most strategic functions in early stage companies and helps organizations translate con complex concepts into compelling and effective co-narrative and marketing strategies. So let's welcome Jim on the stage. Hi, Jim. Hello, Alex. How are you today? I am doing great. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes, I am. And do I still have it? It's about 25, 30 minutes, something like this, Alex. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm doing it right. So I set my timer correct. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Cool. All right. Well, let me share a screen here. Awesome. So um, whenever you're ready, adding it to the stream and the stage is all, all yours. Wonderful. Um, I have the dual monitor thing going. So if there are any questions along the way, please do uh, participate. But thank you, Alex, for the for the very kind intro. And, you know, thank you to the Prisma team. I am actually a uh, oh, where is my oh, it's, it was out of sync. Uh, yeah, I am a developer turned marketer. I haven't coded in a while though, so but I got to tell you, uh, I loved it, and I still kind of stay very, very close to uh, really highly technical companies. Um, you know, I, yeah, I currently work at Cockroach Labs, but I'm a huge fan of Pris Prisma, and I'm just very excited that I am finally on a meetup. Uh, I met, I first met Johannes and Soren, uh, oh gosh, oh years ago. And uh, I've always been excited about what's been going on at this company. So I, I guys, I'm, I'm really excited to be part of this community and, and, and to participate here today. You know, Facundo, I loved your presentation. This is going to be a little bit more academic as opposed to hands-on. Um, but what I want to talk to everybody about today is to really kind of give a little bit of a dive into, you know, Cockroach DB in particular, but, but hopefully use this as a context to go through some of the Kind of the distributed concepts that are in Cockroach. Uh, you know, I'll talk about the Raft algorithm. Um, hopefully, we get to MVCC, which is multi-version concurrency controls. And so, this is a little bit more academic, um, but but I hopefully helpful. Now, please do, gosh, by all means, uh, ask questions along the way. I am trying to monitor um, any questions that come up as well, and I, and I'm fine being interrupted. And if y'all want to just send me questions, I I, I hopefully can answer them. I, I should be able to answer them. So. Um, all right, so about 30 minutes, 25 minutes, we will do this. We got, we got a fair amount, and I hope it is helpful for everybody. So just to set the stage, first of all, you know, there's these concepts of cloud native, and you, know, you hear all these different things. I, you know, to me, cloud native and this kind of move towards these kind of orchestrated systems really comes back to distributed systems. And you know, I'm a big, big, big fan of distributed systems and kind of where things are going. Uh, and, and, and more importantly, I've been in data and databases and data technology for really quite some time. And, I, and I'm watching a lot of data technologies move to the cloud. Um, but when they move to the cloud, this kind of you know, lift and shift, they kind of land in this new infrastructure and they kind of weren't built for that. Or even if you kind of move and improve uh, whatever it is you built, it just doesn't work. Like to really fully take advantage of, of, of like cloud and, and distributed kind of technology and infrastructure, you kind of got to build from the ground up and be cloud native. And I think that's where I see, uh, you know, everything new. <laughs> In my opinion, most of the new apps are kind of going down this concept of, of distributed systems. And, and how do we think about, you know, services in a way that that are, are correct and are going to keep data correct and, and these sort of things. And so, you know, from Cockroach, we think of this as distributed SQL because it's a database that sits underneath kind of one of these distributed systems. That if you're going to build distributed compute and have microservices, all these things that, then the database should kind of align with that. And so, you know, to be distributed SQL, a SQL database, well, first of all, it's got to speak SQL. It's got to ease scale, right? A core principle of kind of distributed systems is, 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 is work scale into your code, not around it, right? Don't use external systems. And also work resilience into your, into your code, not around it, right? Build it into the system itself. Make it naturally resilient and naturally scalable. Um, but if we're going to do this, you know, for us, it was all about, you know, doing ASCII compliant distributed transactions at scale uh, with, with serializable isolation is, was our choice. 
Um, but then also being able to tie data to a location is a is a critical concept to think about, not just within a data database, but in everything we do distributed. Um, you know, we used to think of just data in, in, a, in a single data center or in a single kind of node or whatever that is. And, you know, we think of the logical model, you know, my tables, my rows, uh, you know, my objects and mapping to those and all that and referential integrity. And, you know, that's that's all incredibly important. That's like bullet one. Bullet five is all about, you have to overlay the physical model on data as well, because two things. Number one, the speed of light is no joke. Um, you can't get past the speed of light. If we could, this would be an interesting world. I don't think I'm going to see that in my lifetime, but we'll see. Um, but, but also it, it gets really important as, as our applications and services get deployed in a more complex environment of global regulation and where data lives becomes something that's really important, you know, for us. And, and I believe for distributed systems, you need to work that into the system itself as well. Don't rely on external things or you know, the, the uh, best practice within your development streams to say, hey, data that comes from Germany leaves, needs to live on German servers. You know, what are you going to do that in your, where are you going to do that, right? And, and let's leave the database to actually take care of those things. And so for me, when I think about distributed SQL and, and it, this kind of emergence of these, this, this kind of new brand of database, this is what this is all about. Now, before I get into how we did this, um, just really quickly, like Cockroach is a relational database. It speaks standard, familiar SQL. This is you know, wire compatible with Postgres. Um, you know, we've built ORMs that are integrated that that uh, that that work with Cockroach. So there's lots of stuff out there. I know we're working deeply with the Prisma team, um, and so so this is kind of something that you're just already familiar with. It's just under the covers. It's very very different, right? Because we actually have architecture for scale. You simply spin up a node, point it at the at the cluster, and you have scale. You have this horizontal scale. No need to do manual sharding. No need to deal with all these kind of complex operations to get scale. We can even scale even further beyond a single data center. We could scale into you know multiple regions, which is something that's pretty difficult, right? Because now you're dealing with networks, you're dealing with security problems, uh, and the database just handles this. We can deploy a, a, a cluster of cockroach across multiple different regions, and it's going to function as a single logical database so that you can ask any node for the data, and you're still going to get that data back. And this could even be multi-cloud. Uh, I could we've we have several instances of cockroach that is a region just a region within a single cloud provider or is it multiple different cloud providers and maybe it's on-prem and so, but still having a single logical database across all of this really simplifies, you know, the management and kind of how we think of these things. Typically we would just have to done like some weird asynchronous replication between all these different environments. The database just takes care of all of that. I'm gonna show you how that works uh, in, in a couple minutes. And then it's naturally resilient. We can actually survive the failure of a, of a node, a rack, an AZ, a region, a Kubernetes cluster, if you will. Uh, and it's just naturally resilient. We'll, we'll dive into this as well. Um, but but being able to survive that and still have access to data, no matter what happens, it's, it's kind of eliminates the need of these active passive systems. Cockroach is an active, active database. And I think when we think about how we develop and architect our services, think active, active, I think is just one of the, another core thing to think about when we, when we design and, and build. Now, I touched on something that was kind of cool. You know, in Cockroach, we actually can tie data to a location. So you'll see, here's three records. Uh, that say they're customer records. You know, I have I have copies of these things. Because when I write into Cockroach, I write things in triplicate. I have one copy in US East. I have one copy and two copies in, in Region 3, which is EMEA. But if I access that data from, say, the West Coast, uh, Region 1, US West, uh, I can ask any node for the data. And every node in Cockroach is a single consistent gateway to the entirety of the database. Every node is an endpoint and every node can service reads and writes. So I can ask a node and it just knows where to find it. The, the cluster is smart enough to actually find that data. Now we do this because, well, you wanna be able to access data, but we're, we're, we're actually geo-partitioning. We're taking data and putting it close to the user because you'll see this user is Kimball. He's accessing his data. That's our CEO, Spencer, right? Uh, and that data is closer to them. So that's how we fight the speed of light. Um, you know, because if I had to go from Germany or say Portugal all the way over to, you know, the, the, the West Coast of the United States is at 230, 250 milliseconds one way and then back another five, another 250, 500, you know, what did our round trip time start being? And really anything over 100 milliseconds, um, I think it's a human, humans can identify um, a lag. And so how do we actually work that out of the system? Cockroach, we've taken care of those things. So, 
So that's great. So that's the that's how Cockroach is at the top level. Um, let me just go now go into a little bit how this actually works underneath the covers. Let, let's tear it apart. Now, there is some work here that, that's been built by some amazing engineers. Um, you know, I am honored and fortunate to work at Cockroach. I, I, I really feel lucky in, in, in many of my conversations because some of the stuff that we're doing here, some really amazing software engineering. And, you know, our three founders, you know, Peter Mattis, Spencer Kimball, and Ben Darnell, all of them, you know, early days, Google, you know, I think they were all within that 300 employee range, uh, early days. And, you know, and they sat beside and, and, and worked along with, you know, the Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gemawat and, and Eric Brewer and, and, and the people at Google who have really kind of changed the way we think about systems and data uh, at, at scale. And I think if I look at all the technology that's out there, some of these things that have happened in these large, you know, web scale companies, especially Google, you know, we're seeing this stuff kind of take hold and now be commoditized out for everybody to work on. And I think that's what this is. And so a lot of the concepts here come from uh, the Google Cloud Spanner. So they have an internal database, a relational database that is distributed. If you ever want to read a cool paper, uh, it's a great paper to read. There's a lot of great publications on the Google uh, publication site. Uh, some really cool things, uh, you know, MapReduce, Big Tables, gosh, the beginning of NoSQL, Spanner for this distributed SQL category, all the TensorFlow stuff. Um, but, but these, these, you know, there's some really, really great innovation and, and a lot of stuff. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, thank you to, to a whole world of people who worked on some really, really cool stuff here. So, all right. So how does this work underneath the covers? Well, any database is really can be broken down into, I, I like to think of it as three layers, right? There is the language, which honestly, if it's a database, I just feel that, you know, SQL is kind of. You, you you can't get away without doing SQL. Like and and for us, yeah, we we chose to be wire compatible with Postgres. So the SQL syntax is the language. And then there's an execution layer, right? That's where all the magic happens, and we do reads and writes. And then there's a storage layer because ultimately the database writes data to disk, right? Um, and building a database is is sounds simple when I break it down into three layers, but it's just simply not. Um, you know, there's another kind of luminary in the database space, a guy by the name of Michael Stonebreaker who actually won the Turing Award a couple of years back. It's just brilliant. Um, and, you know, Stonebreaker said it takes about seven to eight years for a database to fully gestate and be kind of, you know, reliable. Uh, and I love it because it's it's all the weird corner cases in a database that'll kill you. If it was easy to build a database, we'd all do it, right? Like, you know, like, why not just make that part of my app itself? And so it's just simply not because there's so much that, that happens. And so, Underneath the cockroach, we're building a database, but but as a distributed system. And so we chose to be uh, SQL. Now, ultimately, when we store data, we're actually using KV at the lowest layer. The storage layer, we've implemented, we built a new database there. It's actually a database on top of a database. We built a database called Pebble. Pebble is is a, a kind of a rewrite of RocksDB, and we wrote it in Go uh, because all of Cockroach is actually written in Go. Uh, the code base is all available on our Git repo if, if you're interested. But ultimately, every table is is written to disk as this kind of monolithic logical key space, right? So the dogs table has, you know, these, what is this, 12 records, and they're just kind of, they're ordered, see, right? C, D, F, J, right? And so everything is kind of ordered lexico lexicographically. Now, an old database, like the traditional relational database is, you know, if we had an inventory table, you know, we had glove, ball, shirt, shoes, bat, shoes. It, it, we would just keep appending records to a table, right? Just in order, in storage, just keep appending records. And then we use an index to find these things. At the, at the you know, the most generic level, that's kind of how the storage layer and how we actually access data in a, in a relational table, right? Now, now, Cockroach, we're doing something different. We actually use KV and, and KV allows us to do some really cool things. Um, it allows us to get really, really fast. We have some really powerful primitives in a, in a KV store that we can actually use, you know. But ultimately, when we store data, the K, the K in the in the KV is the table name, the index for that particular table, the key, and then a column name, and then the value is the value of that column. Now, all of this is encoded into the key. It isn't written exactly like this, you know. So. We get you know huge massive efficiencies when we sort and do some really interesting things here, and I'll show you how that actually helps us. But all tables have to have a primary key because it's part of of the K and the KV. Now, if we were to take this table here, uh, you know this is the dogs table with an ID and a weight added to it, right? And it's a pretty simple table and SQL syntax, right? The DDL is that. 
great, I have this nice table. Now, how do I change that to translate that to KV? At the simplest layer, it's pretty simple. What we're doing is we take the, the first column here and we say, okay, great. It's gonna actually be the first row. And this is gonna actually end up being two, 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 two rows in our KV when we store it. Table name, the key, the column name, and then the value is Carl, right? And so that, that record was broken down into two and we keep doing this. And so if you look at the sort here, right? The sort is really brilliant, right? We have the table name and then the key and then these columns. And so everything is gonna be sorted and stacked. So now when we insert, we know exactly where to insert. Uh, when we start to do things like range scans, we can take advantage of this, this KV range scans, right? And so there's some really kind of interesting things that we can do that, but that's the magic of how we actually can turn relational into KV and then KV back into relational uh, at the lowest layer of what Cockroach is doing, right? And so I think some really interesting things here. Um, you know, I, 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 when I explain this to, to, to salespeople and other people, I, I just bring up like an Excel spreadsheet and I show how you can sort and all these different things. But, but it's pretty cool because I'm going to sort within, you know, uh, you know, dog table. And then you can imagine another table after that. It's, you know, maybe it's, 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 it's ferrets or something, you know, and then everything's going to be in order. And that's going to come back because I'm going to talk about how we actually can tie data to a location. We're going to use this, this concept, right? So everything is this monolithic key space, right? And then what we do is we take each table and we're going to break it down into ranges. You could think of a range as a shard or a tablet. Uh, you know, it, it, what we do is we, we, we call them ranges. It's a 520, 512 megabit range, right? And so it contains X amount of records depending on, on the table itself. But these things are small enough so that we can move them around pretty easily and we can do things like splitting them. And so this is how we get away with scaling the database without ever having, like you never have to worry about sharding. We could actually collapse ranges together and we could expand them. So what happens when you know we have these ranges? Well, you also need an index structure to find these ranges because they're gonna be distributed you know, across multiple different places. Um, and so this is, if you're familiar with what a B tree is, it's very much like a B tree. Um, that's kind of how we implemented that, right? And so now we can find these, these, these ranges. Now, it allows it, like I said, allows us to do these kind of cool, quick uh, uh, range scans, but when I want to insert a record, well, I go go through this index, I find where, you know, if I want to insert Sunny into this, this table, right, I know where to insert it. And so I come down, uh, I ask this range, hey, is there enough space? Yes, it seems like there's a there's an open space here. Great. Let's insert Sunny. Wonderful. Great. That That's nothing has happened, right? Well, what happens when the range is full? Now I want to insert another record into this. Well, the database is smart enough to take that range and split it and now insert that record so that it now has space. I have just sharded the database. I had just created a new shard without anything ever happening to the to the user. Now, again, say over time, you know, records get deleted. We'll we actually compact these things as well. But this is one of the magical areas of Cockroach that I found kind of really, really interesting. Now, if you think about this, this is the automation and the working of scale into the system itself. Right, um, thinking about how we actually do this across multiple different services um, get, gets really, really complex. And I think that's where the beauty of of some of the the more you know complex concepts in distributed systems really kind of help us think uh, about how we scale and, and and build resilience into our system. So now, now in Cockroach, we also use something called Raft. If you're not familiar with Raft, go check it out. I, I get, I'll give a link at the end of this little section on on, on where to go. Um, Raft is a distributed consensus algorithm. It really allows us to provide atomic rights and consistent reads. Now, okay, so what does that mean? Well, Raft is really implemented as uh, there's this concept of a replica set in Raft, right? And if you think about that blue range, what was it? I guess, what was it? It was Lady, Lula, Muddy, and Petey. I think that's blue. I don't know, I'm a little colorblind. Well, when we write to a, a system and we write this data, we're actually going to write it in triplicate. And, and what Raft does is it manages... Uh, uh, you know, sets of these replicas, these these replica sets of data, right? So it's the same data across all three of these replicas. You know, in this case, I have three. It could be five, it could be seven, it could be nine, it could be an odd number. We'll come back to that. Um, but it's a real chatty protocol and it basically keeps everything aligned, right? And these these raft groups is, is really kind of the magic here. Now, within each raft group, there is a leader. And the leader basically is kind of like the the authoritative source. It is always right. And then there's followers that always keep up with this with this authoritative leader, right? And then only that leader can serve up the most up-to-date information, right? Now I have two, I have three copies of this data. 
you can kind of go where we're going. This is where we're going to actually use this to, to store data within a, within you know physical nodes, right? Um, and then basically what it does is also a deliver is this 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 atomic replication. So when we write, basically the RAF leader is in charge of making sure that the data is going to be correct across all three replicas. So it's going to implement something called a quorum write, so that two of three of the nodes, two of three of the replicas, actually have to com to commit that data, and then we're actually say, great, we're good. The third one, if it's out of sync, it will always come back and always be in sync. Okay, so we're using Raft uh, it, it extensively here. It's a pretty pretty powerful implementation of Raft in Go. Um, actually, we share, you know, we actually contribute upstream. If you're familiar with etcd, which is kind of a core component of, uh, you know, of, of Kubernetes and whatnot, we actually uh, presume that up. But if you go to this website, Secret Lives of Data, there's a much deeper uh, explanation of Raft and how it works. I think it's, they do a great job. I, I put lots of people there. So. But but Raft is kind of one of these really interesting protocols uh, in, a, in an algorithm that I think is you know one of these more advanced algorithms that's really starting to drive the way we think about how we architect systems and how we think about data in our systems. Now, we, like again, you know, we do this in our database, but you know, I think it's actually there's a lot to learn here for everybody in terms of you know these distributed principles, and that's why I like going through the architecture of Cockroach because I think it opens up the minds of some of the things, the different ways that we do things, right? Like I said, you know, Facundo was more like, uh, you know, hands-on. This is a little bit more academic, okay? All right, so we then use Raft to do um, uh, how we distribute data physically within these things. Um, and, oh, and by the way, if there are questions, I am actually monitoring. I hope I can see the questions if they come up. Um, uh, the, the live stream as well. So I have a second monitor here going. So, so where do we place replicas? In a, where do we place these replicas, right? I have these, these three replicas in a Raft group. I want to place them in different ways because I want to do things like scale. I want to survive, right? And so there's lots of different ways we do this, right? And so typically for us, you know, people think about failure domains. What do I want to survive? Or they want to even out data, right? And so each, each RAF group here, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this first range, the first 512 megabits, and I'm going to write it to three physical nodes. These are three physical cockroach nodes that are all functioning as a single logical database, right? Um, and so I'm going to write the first RAF group across three nodes. I'm going to start the second one. I'm going to write the third one. I have evenly distributed this data across four nodes. Now, if a node goes down, I still have access to that data. I have two or three of the replicas left. I'm guaranteed that I'm still going to be able to write and read that data, right? But we also do things like, you know, you want to distribute data based on load, you know, say like maybe this middle range here is being accessed a whole lot. You know, we use heuristics, uh, uh, you know, with the, with the transactions to actually understand that. So we can maybe we separate that data out on its own nodes so that we can actually optimize the compute that it's running on, right? And so the database is smart enough to actually do that to really kind of optimize, you know, performance and whatnot um, using heuristics of, of the queries that are going on at any, any particular moment. Now, we can also do something really cool, like we can actually geo-partition data, which just means basically we can take data and tie it to a location. Do you remember earlier when I when I had the key, the K and the KV? Well, we had table name, we had key, um, we had the column name. Well, what if we actually added in a country code to that, right? Well, then everything in that ordered pair and that ordered kind of lexicographical set would be ordered. It would now have this this country code in there. So, like you would imagine. EU and Carl, EU and Lula. And so now everything is ordered. Now when I split up my ranges, everything is mixed up, but it's actually split by like by by a country code. So I can use a column in each row to actually change the sort of the lexicographic sort of the KV. And now I can be assured that well all these ranges, oh, this is a little bit wrong. This these colors here are a little bit off. This first range is going to be written to, you know, the EU nodes. The second range, I can actually create rules that this is going to be written to the to the east and then to the west. And, and it's really a simple couple, you know, four DDL kind of statements that allow you to do this in Cockroach. And if we actually do it, uh, it, it this this can all happen in, 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 in production, right? So all this, you know, as a distributed system is, right? So... Um, so that's, so that's how we actually do that. So that's kind of a really special thing that we're doing in Cockroach about how we actually can tie data to location. Okay. All right. So we can also rebalance replicas. So how do we scale? Well, I simply add a new node into that point to the, to the, I point a new node. I'd spin it up, point at the cluster. The database is smart enough to actually, Oh, I have free space. Let's, let's evenly build things out. I can survive the failure. Oh, look at my, two of my replicas are gone. 
Um, you know, the, the RAF leader is smart enough to understand that, oh gosh, I have to create new copies on other, on other machines. If the RAF leader goes away, the two surviving uh, replicas, the followers will actually nominate a new one. Uh, there's a RAF leader nomination process, which actually is pretty cool. Uh, and then we can actually survive these little small failures as well. Okay. All right. So about 10 more minutes left. And yeah, this, this is going to work. I, I definitely can get through the, the last bit here. I know it's a lot. I'm talking a little fast. But again, if there's any comments, good, bad comments, good, bad uh, clarification, gosh, by all means, um, um, please do uh, reach out. And let me know. Okay. All right. So transactions in a database, all, it's all about acid, right? Atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. We spent a lot of time at Cockroach thinking about isolation. You know, we wanted to build a database that was not only going to kind of fight the speed of light, but would also be optimized on uh, transactional consistency. You know, a lot of developers don't think about isolation levels in a database, which I think is actually, you know, I I was I I didn't I was a hack. I didn't think a whole lot about these shows about these things a whole lot. Um, but but now that I kind of know the the things that can go wrong with data the hacks that can happen in your system, the security holes they cause, um, you know, having a database that that's, you know, non-repeatable read or, uh, you know, these other kind of isolation levels uh, actually is, is tricky, you know, uh, and there's trade-offs of performance versus isolation and guaranteed correctness. And so I think it's kind of one of these things that I like to talk about a lot. And, and so at Cockroach, we've actually implemented serializable isolation, which means basically Every transaction is going to be run in order, or apparently going to look as if it if it runs in order, um, and 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 that is really basically the top level. This isn't like a NoSQL database. I know there was like somebody used Mongo. Like you can't get this level of of isolation in something that's like a NoSQL database. The the data model and the way that things work underneath are actually really too difficult to actually overlay transactions on top of. So you'll get like eventually consistent, but you won't get like guaranteed you know 100% consistent, right? And so. It's kind of one of those special things about cockroach, but 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 you know, pegging out on isolation level the, the furthest we can go and then fighting the speed of light all at the same time has forced us to do some really, really interesting software engineering. Um, if you want to actually dive into the stuff that I'm going through here in, in more depth, they I think our docs do a great job of talking about this stuff. Um, I always give kudos to our docs team because it's just truly amazing some of the stuff they they built, um, and I learned from there. Um, and actually, we published a Sigmod paper uh, about a year ago, maybe now. Gosh, man, time flies. Uh, and and that Sigmod paper actually uh, goes into detail a lot more of what's going on. So, um, all right. So actually, somebody asked a question. I have three locations. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, one has limited connection bandwidth. Is this harming general latency? That is a great question, Thomas. So say you have three nodes, you have three locations, maybe you have three nodes in three locations, and I have this, you know, this weird kind of connection between one of them. It depends on what latency you're looking for, because honestly, if we actually locate all the data for the transactions that are going to happen in that region into those three nodes or into that one, you know, into that there, that area, well, I'm going to get fast read write access in that in that region. Now, what if, you know, I'm just arbitrary and putting things across and I ask from one region into the next? It could have issues because you have this kind of latency thing. But what's interesting is you want the raft leader, that authoritative source, to follow the user. And we do things in Cockroach to actually help make that happen. So really, Thomas, it really depends on what you want to optimize for. Do you want to optimize for latency or do you want to optimize for resiliency? And Cockroach gives you all the knobs and the dials to actually figure that out. Uh, and it's really down to the row level. It could be the table level or even the row level. It's not the whole database. It is really kind of something you think about, uh, you know, at the data at the row level, um, which is a, kind of a really key thing there. So, all right. So transactions. So I want to insert these two records into uh, into this table, into the dogs table. I'm going to basically start. Ooh, where am I? Where's my mouth? Here we go. All right. So I'm going to start this transaction. Um, I'm going to ask any node. Remember, any node is an endpoint, right? So any node is a gateway. And I'm just going to, so it's green. Um, I'm just going to say, okay, great. I'm going to start. Now we st we create basically a special record um, within this within this range, which basically says I have a transaction that's pending. It's just some, there's some system records that we actually use within each one of these to actually do this. And I'm just going to create. I'm going to go out to my followers. I'm going to say, hey, create a temporary record here and insert it. And then as soon as one of those if followers come back and I get acknowledgement, I now have two of three of my replicas are confirmed. I'm going to be good. I can go on to the next record, right? And I'm going to now insert Ozzy. 
this does the same thing. As soon as I get one back to create, I have two of three. Now I can basically say, look at all these markers, these kind of temporary records that I've wrecked. I've got basically across all of the steps in my transaction, right? Because each SQL query, each, every SQL query gets broken down into this, you know, amazing set of, tra you know, transactional steps, right? Now that I got this, and then when I go to commit, the commit says, great, go out and clear everything out, make everything confirmed and send acknowledgement back to the requesting application. Now that seems pretty simple. Now, lots of things can go wrong here. Uh, and, and, you know, that's where I think the tricky part of Cockroach and a lot of stuff that we did, uh, which is really, really, truly special. Doing this in a distributed system is, is also, uh, you know, a, a challenge as well. But this is kind of really how magically how that works. Um, and, and, you know, we do a lot of things under the covers to, to actually make this happen. Now, one of the things we, we, we have implemented is we've implemented MVCC, which is multi-version concurrency control. Another really interesting um, algorithm that allows for, for transactions so that there's going to be no overlap in transactions. Now, I'm going to go through, listen, I'm the marketer, right? But I'm just going to go through a top-level description of how this works. Actually, if you go to the Wikipedia article on MVCC, I found it to be pretty awesome. Um, it, it's a pretty good description of, of what this is. But basically, there's kind of three things involved here. We have something we want to do with the data, the transaction. We have a timestamp for that transactions. And then there's this object or a row of data that we want to actually, you know, affect, right? And so what we do is that for a simple transaction, we just start off at time zero. We, we have this transaction that wants to happen. We communicate the write over to the object. The object now uh, has two timestamps. It has a read timestamp and a write timestamp. We increment the write timestamp to be what was the moment that that actually happened. We create a temporary object. And in this temporary object, we're actually going to create, we're going we're gonna to change the state and it's going to come back and everything looks good. And that took two seconds. And so now what I've done, when the, when the temporary object actually commits, basically it says everything's good. It comes back and it says, hey, look at the time between the read and the write was two seconds. So update my read timestamp to three. Now I know basically that when the last write came in and when the last commit actually happened on each object. Okay. So that's a simple flow. Let's, let's, let's try it again with a conflict, right? Transaction comes in. I do the write. My write timestamp went up. I go write the other temp object. And in the between me writing that other temp object and basically me updating that, that read timestamp, it kind of getting committed on the second object, another write has come in. And this timestamp now, timestamp two is 02. It's at two seconds in. Well, what it does, it says, hey, wait a second. My timestamp is greater than the read timestamp. So I have a conflict. I have to deal with this now. I have to resolve this. Now, the database is just taking care of this in the background. But this is kind of one of those things as you have distributed systems and you have, you know, multiple different requesters asking another object for something. MVCC is great for a database, but MVCC might be very interesting in the way that you implement you know, a consistency for your transactions as well. I think this is a really, really important algorithm um, to understand. But but this whole like the timestamp, the read and the write, that, that's the basics of it. Um, gosh, I just explained it pretty simply as a marketing guy, but, but there's a whole lot of complexity there. Now, what we have to do with Cockroach and when you use Cockroach, well, you're going to have to wrapper your, your, your transactions with a, with a try catch block because this, this stuff happens. Um, because you have, you know, people all over the planet and thousands and hundreds of thousands of transactions going against the database at any moment. Um, and so this this kind of stuff actually becomes pretty, pretty important. So so long story short, MVC just allows you basically every transaction is going to happen like like you're standing in line. Next, next, right? Like single, single teller, right? So, um, okay. So I think, you know what? I am at I am at the, the, the bottom of my time. So I'm not going to go through any of the other stuff that I have here, but I will tell you, um, we have some great coursework in Cockroach. There's free university. We'll give you free swag for all this. And then if you want to actually go try Cockroach, there, there is Cockroach Cloud as well. So um, that was a fair amount in 30 minutes. I believe I was very right there at 30 minutes. So Alex, um, thank you. And, and if there's any questions, gosh, by all means, you know, please feel, feel free to reach out to me. And then I'm also, um, I'm just at James, J-A-Y-M-C-E on Twitter. I, I mean, almost everywhere. James at Gmail. I, I think I, I've consolidated all over the place on that. So, so Alex, that's the that I just wanted to thank everybody. That's the end of my presentation. Awesome. I enjoyed the talk and I learned a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it seems that developer tools keep getting better and better, including databases. I just learned about MVCC. I hope I don't forget that. I only have one. 
question though um is there sort of a performance issue when you're translating a, a request or a query from sql to kv and then sql again perhaps? yeah 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 so we aren't really i mean I, Yes, right. Like there is, there is this concept of like if it's a straight transaction going, we actually gain a whole lot in translating a KV at the storage layer. Um, it actually it ends up being I, I, I it ends up being faster because the way that we access data, we don't have to always go through the index, right? We don't have to go through this complex index process of like where it actually gets stored. We're using KV and the primitives of get of KV like the get and the put which are like, that's why people invented KV databases, right? Cause they were so fast, right? Um, we aren't using pointers at the bottom layer to actually go out and get the storage. Now look at, look at Oracle and Postgres, these things, man, that layer is so incredibly optimized because it's been around for 15, 20, geez, 40 years, you know, it's really, really fast. Um, that's not the areas that we're worried about latency. That's the stuff that's kind of simple and straightforward for us. For us, latency is is raft. When I have to write to two nodes, um, you know, like I think Thomas's question uh, is it's related to that. When I have to when I have to get quorum and two no, two two replicas are in different, like one is in Sydney and one is in New York. You know, that's the stuff that gets really interesting. And we've done some really interesting software engineering, something called parallel commits, which you know we can't change the speed of light, but but we can change the photons that are going over. That's the way I like to explain it, right? And so. We could forward commit a transaction on one node, look at the, the picture of it around it, send that to the next node, and it'll just look at the picture around everything and say, hey, look, at, I am pretty sure this thing is going to commit to five nines. Great. Just send back an acknowledgement that I'm going to commit. Like, we've done some really interesting things from a software engineering point of view to, to kind of fight the, the speed of light latency. That's the one that we're most worried about, Alex. Awesome. Thank you. Um, also, before you leave, uh share the link in the chat so that we can also post it to our audience. Yeah, you bet, you bet. I'll, I'll get the slides to you. So um, I hope that was helpful. Um, thank you. It was, and thank you again for being part of the meetup. Awesome. Yeah, you bet.